Part two, repentance. In order for us to truly be happy, we must get our slate clean. Our conscience is what tells us what sin is and what sin is not. Each one of us have a conscience that uh, you know tells us our it's our barometer. How far are we going and how far do we need to go? That is sin. When our conscience is bugging us, it is a good thing. It tells us that we need to work on something. A lot of times we take antidepressants, we take medicines, we take pills, we take any kind of drugs we can get our hands on to numb that conscience when it flares up. And, you know, that's like saying, you know, if I have a boil on my leg, I'm just going to, uh, you know, wrap it uh, or, or put a little cortisone in there or, or something to where it just numbs the pain. It doesn't, doesn't break that boil, it doesn't uh, clean the pus out. It just numbs the pus. So for a while, I'm going to feel okay. But uh, in order for me to truly get my leg to heal, I need to poke it. I need to squeeze the pus out. I need to disinfect it, wrap it properly so it can heal. And that is how depression works in our life. When we are depressed, it is our body telling us that something is not right. And so instead of numbing that depression, we need to use that and pinpoint why are we depressed and then go to the root cause of why that happens. Now, the definition of sin is going against your conscience. Every time we go against our conscience, it's going to let us know and it's going to uh, block those endorphins that bring us happiness. And in order to relieve those endorphins and, uh, and get that natural state of happiness, we need to repent of our sins. Now, why is repentance important? And what is repentance? Repentance is when we have realized that we have done wrong and we now need to confess that sin to God and ask Him for forgiveness. Uh, reason why is because we are not meant, we were not created to be animals. We were not created to be the beast of the field. We are created to be perfect beings. And so inside of us, God gave us that similitude, that, uh, that conscience that gives us the, the guideline, if you will. It's our inner compass that tells us what to reckon we're going and how we are to get there. All prophets throughout all ages have had the same message to mankind, and it is to repent. Um, it's not uh, something that uh, is a difficult thing. It is something that is necessary for us to make it back to our home in heaven. Um, the only difficulty about it is if we fight against it. And you might as well be fighting against the waves of the sea because this is just a natural course of events. Uh, many people, when they have had these near-death experiences, they all say the same thing. And that was, I saw my life flash before me. Now, why is God showing us our whole life review? Why are we getting a chance to see these, uh, these events that took place in our lives? Well, it's so that we can help judge ourselves. We can help understand um, why we made the decisions that we made in this life. This life is a big education. It's a learning experience for us to understand how to become like our father and mother in heaven. That was what we came here for. We saw them in a perfect state, and we asked, how can we become like you guys? And they says, well, you got to do what we did. And number one, the planet was created for this purpose, so that we could come down here. And, and let me tell you, folks, uh, this out of all the creations that God has created. Now, Enoch, for example, asked God, he says, how many worlds like ours do you have? And God says, well, pick up a handful of dirt and look at it. And so he does. And he says, I have more worlds like this than there are sands of the sea. And out of all these planets I created, this is the most wicked of all. So what kind of souls is he going to send to this planet? And why is it the most wicked? Well, as we talked earlier um, in different lectures, uh, when the one-third of heaven was cast out, Satan and his angels, um, where did God put them? You know, instead of infecting the whole galaxy with this plague, he contained it all on one planet. And this is why this planet is considered the footstool of God. This is where God is going to dwell. This is where the same battle that we fought in heaven is, has now come to earth. And we're going to fight this battle here again. 
And so we use the same angels that fought in the first war in heaven. And the ones that fought the hardest, the, the frontline warriors, he preserved them for this time. Now, they may have had a few lifetimes in between, but they were mostly sent as the noble and great ones of our latter days. We are the ones who have done it before. We have won this war already before. And so it makes sense that we're going to win it again. Now, we're instead of on God's turf, we're now on Satan's turf. Satan is known as the god of this world. Why? Because most of the world follows after money. They follow after mammon. Money was put here by Satan as a uh, curse to God's children. In the Garden of Eden, after God, you know, uh, cursed the serpent and, and took away his arms and legs and made him, you know, crawl on his belly, and the dust of the earth shall he eat all the days of his life, Satan says, okay, since you're doing this to me, I'm going to do this to your kids. I'm going to create money, and, and I'm going to rule the world with this. I will raise up tyrants and, and all kinds of you know, terroristic uh, men in power that will destroy and enslave your children. And what better slavery could he create than to give us the world of materialism? This is why Jesus tells us, do not build for yourselves treasures here on this earth. Build for yourselves treasures in heaven where thieves can't break in and steal and, and, and moth won't corrupt it or rust won't uh, you know, ruin your treasures. Most people these days, uh, and especially when you've got a family and kids, I mean, they don't know any other way of life besides the way of money. Now, we're going to break that cycle when Christ comes. When He comes, we are going to become like Him. And I actually believe we're going to get to the point where we can do the works that He has done and greater works than these, as He says. Never will it mean that we're greater than Him. It just means a time will come when we're going to have to use a little bit more uh, tactics, probably. And so it all boils down to repentance. We need to get our temple clean so that the Holy Ghost can dwell within our temple. Now, what happens is when we ask for forgiveness and we begin to live the words of Christ. Now, Jesus fulfilled the old law. No longer do we have ten commandments we need to worry about. There's only two commandments now. The number one is to love the Lord thy God with all of your heart, with all of your might, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. That means every thought, every action, every desire needs to be focused toward the Lord our God. And the second commandment is likened to it, to love your fellow man as yourself. That's it. If we were to keep those two commandments, we would keep all the ten. We wouldn't steal, we wouldn't kill, we wouldn't uh, commit adultery. We wouldn't do any of these ten if we just merely loved God and loved our fellow men. And in order to truly love God, we need to become cleansed of our sins. As he says, when this wedding feast comes, only those with the unspotted garments will be allowed in this wedding feast. And so we need to take this dirt and we need to put this in the washer. We need to do our own dirty laundry, if you will. Now, Christ has already paid the price for us. This is the beauty about God's plan. You know, the banker don't care who gives them the mortgage. They just want their money. And so, same with the devil. Okay, Before Christ came, he owned hell. But after Christ did what he did, he went straight down to hell after he died to see what he just bought. Because he came to set the captives free. He was the one who came to release the chains that have bound us since the days of Adam. And now the veil has been torn. There is no veil between man and God anymore. So brothers and sisters, it's time that we get up on our horses and we, and we pray and we ask for that forgiveness. And, and the reason why forgiveness is so important is it changes our chemical uh, chemistry, if you will. Our frequencies will change. No longer do we have that empty feeling in our gut that there's just this hole that can't be filled. Repentance plugs that hole up and it allows your cup to contain that energy so when it comes into us, it will uh, begin to flow over. Repentance is the most important thing that we could possibly do. If we don't do it in this life, it's going to be very hard to do it in the next life. And let me tell you, brothers and sisters, there's nothing more satisfying than a clean conscience. There's nothing better in life than knowing that you are acceptable before God. 
knowing that when you die, if you do die, that you will be taken up into the glories of the heavens with a clean slate. Now, you know, we all make mistakes. We all come down and we sin. I mean, this is why we were here is to, is to touch that fire sometimes so we know it's hot. You could tell a kid a hundred times, don't touch that fire because it's hot. But they won't learn that lesson as well as touching the fire. Now, I don't uh, you know, recommend everyone touching fires, believe me. I don't recommend everyone deliberately trying every sin they can so that they can know that it's not good. That's why we gave, uh, the good Lord gave us a mind, so that we can reason, we can know. And our conscience tells us before we even sin that it's going to be a sin. So the bottom line is just following what he has given inside of us so that we can overcome the flesh. You know, we're not a spiritual being, uh, excuse me, we're not a physical being having a spiritual experience. We're a spiritual being having a physical experience. We have lived for eons of time already. And now uh, we've come down here in, again in a state of amnesia to see who we truly are. This is how God sees what kind of character we truly have. And who is going to follow him and who is going to follow the world. Uh, the greatest uh, sermon ever given was the Sermon on the Mount. This is the formula to happiness. This is the gift that God give, has given us is I believe the greatest miracle of Jesus besides his atonement is the Sermon on the Mount. Now again, he healed the sick, the lame, the blind, he rose the dead. He's done a lot of miracles in his day, but what good does that do me in my day? It's his words that live on. And again, you know, one thing all psychologists on earth agree on is the answers to all of life's problems are given in those three chapters of Matthew. Matthew 5, 6, and 7. This teaches us how not only to repent, but how we stay off that path of sin. You know, imagine taking all the pains of hell and putting it on one man for three hours. And then beating him, you know, whipping him, and nailing him to a cross. That's what this guy went through for our sins. Now, the best thing we can do is to help feed those sheep. Whenever you're depressed... You go find joy in helping others. Jesus says, He who tries to save his life will lose it, but he who willingly gives his life to others will find eternal life. Once we've repented, and repentance is merely this, brothers and sisters, Dear Father in heaven, please forgive me of my sins. I take upon myself the name of Christ and allow his blood to cover my sins. Let me be forgiven through the blood of Christ, because He is my Savior. He is my Redeemer. You know, one thing uh, everyone agreed on that went to these near-death experiences and actually went downstairs instead of upstairs, they faced the torments of hell. And believe me, you can YouTube this, and you will find many stories of people's visitation to hell. And one thing they all have in common is the one name that got them out of that place was Jesus Christ. After seeing the torture and the torment down there, they realized, and something inside of them said, man, when I was a kid, I went to Sunday school, and I remembered about this guy Jesus and how he did this and that. Then that's when they decided to call upon his name. Please don't wait till you get to that point. But uh, that is what freed them from the chains of hell. He owns hell. But if you don't call upon his name, if you don't accept his blood to cover your sins, then you are left to justice, and you will reap the rewards of your own doings. Now, I don't know about you, brothers and sisters, but if God offered me justice or mercy, I would ask for mercy. Because I know that if all my sins came upon me at once, I would cease to exist. And believe me, brothers, we've all been there. Uh, the greatest uh, sermon ever given, the Sermon on the Mount, we'll get more into that on our next discussion. Uh, this is part two of the discussions and lectures on God, and we will see you at part three.